annual East African migration has finally kicked off. The abundance of water and grass attracts herbivores on a huge scale, and this is the moment the lions have been waiting for. Next, they'll go on a killing spree. The Dorobo people, who also live on this grassland, are waiting for this moment. Three men stand on a high hill and look out into the morning light. They are following in the footsteps of the horned horses, hunting valuable food for their people. However, the bows and arrows they carried had limited killing power and could not deal a fatal blow to the prey. Instead of spending a lot of energy chasing the prey, they should let the lions hunt the horned horses. Then they would snatch the prey from the lions' mouths. Hello, you're watching All Things Have Light 186. This episode takes us into wild Africa to see how humans have become masters of the savanna. Taraji is 65 years old. He is a seasoned hunter. He is followed by two young men, who are mainly there to give him courage and support. First, Taraji has to find the lion's tracks, and he has to be on his guard at all times. This is, after all, the territory of man-eating beasts. Vultures circle overhead. The strange cries of hyenas echo in his ears. Paul prints were clearly visible on the dirt floor. From this, Taraji judges that lions are probably not far away. Sure enough, a lioness appears in the bush. Sneaking up on the lioness, the trio found a pride of lions that had just finished hunting. The male lions were showing their rage and anger in order to take over the feeding priority. Taraji has been attacked by lions before. He has seen the majesty of the king of beasts. There are as many as 15 lions in front of him. If they turn around and run away now, they will probably be spotted by the lions and become their hunting target. As the saying goes, the narrow road is won by the brave. If they were united and showed extraordinary vigor, the victory or defeat might be rewritten. The three of them acted in unison and rose violently. They strutted towards the lions with their heads held high. It was as if they were saying, Ken, we are not afraid of you. This is an ultimate duel, but also a psychological game. They fought with confidence and courage. Although their hearts were beating wildly, they had to bluff their way to the end. The lions looked very puzzled. Once a lion is cowed and leads the way to escape, the entire pride of lions would scatter and withdraw. Taraji must fight for time before the lions realize the deception. He quickly cuts off the hind legs of the horned horses and carries them on his shoulders to leave gracefully. Though they have no sharp teeth or claws, but with great daring, they overcame their formidable opponents. They took the legend of the lion's mouth and turned it into reality. At night, the three of them went to a cave to rest. They light a bonfire and roast raw meat. Taraji says proudly, not everyone dares to stand up to a lion. Those who are afraid of death, of course, don't have the guts. It's a hunting technique passed down from generation to generation by our ancestors. They used the beasts to kill for themselves, and it took extraordinary guts and courage, and it's even harder to hunt with your own hands. The Kalahari at the southern tip of Africa is one of the largest deserts in the world. It occupies most of Botswana's landmass. Herbivores are rarer here than in the East African savanna. Quinton is a local indigenous hunter. Today, he is passing on his skillful hunting experience to his apprentice. This hunt began with a fire. This is the only source of water within a few dousing kilometers. The master and apprentice set fire to the nearby barren grass. As a result, there was nowhere for drinking prey to hide. Like the Dorbo who took meat from the lion's mouth, their weapons were too small and their killing power was limited. They could not kill their prey on the spot, so they had to improve their weapons. As a locally renowned master hunter, Quentin knows better than anyone where to look for poison. Hidden in the slate gravel are the larvae of a beetle. They secrete bodily fluids that contain a powerful poison. Just a single drop can kill its prey. Quentin carefully applies the venom to an arrowhead, far away on the other side of the world. In South America, arrow poison frogs are abundant. This is very similar to the way the natives use poison. Herbivores tended to be very alert. The master and apprentice have built a simple hut to conceal themselves. Quentin hopes his apprentice will be successful in his first battle, but the apprentice's experience is clearly lacking, though he peeks out silently to observe his prey. But this alerts the striped antelope, who have come to drink. They soon flee without a trace. In this grassland, surrounded by predators, the prey has to be more cunning than the hunter to survive. Quentin takes the opportunity to teach his apprentice that you must not let the prey see your face. Two days later, the antelope does not appear. Instead, they wait for an unexpected visitor, a big, burly leopard, prowling through the bush. It made them both instantly nervous. The leopards bite an agility far exceeded that of humans, but seemingly sensing something strange around them. The master and disciple lowered their bodies and held their breath. They secretly prayed not to be discovered by it. Fortunately, the leopard was very facetious. After drinking the water, it laughed alone. They lurked like this for six days, but found nothing. Just when they were in despair, a herd of striped antelope finally arrived. This time, they could not afford to miss the opportunity. The master and the apprentice unanimously drew their bows full. With a whoosh, they shot out, hitting the target with a single shot. The herd scatters. 
They were ecstatic that their days of hard work had been rewarded with success. They shook hands and congratulated each other. But the hunt is only half successful, as the heavily arrowed antelope will continue to run for many kilometers. The first thing the master and the apprentice did was to find the dislodged arrow shaft. After determining that it was the apprentice who had shot the prey, Quinton was proud of him. As long as the toxin seeps into the bloodstream of the prey, it will fall. No matter how far it runs, the master and apprentice track the trail all the way. Finally, a few hours later, they find the wounded antelope. The poison had taken effect and the antelope was in a state of near death. The apprentice goes up and delivers the killing blow. The prey fell to the ground, ending its life. The master and apprentice have ended their seven-day hunt. The meat was enough to feed their clan for a long time. After the barren grass near the water source is burned, all it takes is a sweet rain to bring the grassland back to life. With enough water, the growth of pasture is even visible to the naked eye. Let's return to the East African savanna. The Maasai have thrived here for thousands of years. As a native nomadic people, the Maasai's life has been integrated with this grassland. They are familiar with every blade of grass and every tree. They have even learned to cooperate with the wildlife for tasty food. To the honey creeper, the name alone is a bit strange. The Maasai attract them with a special whistle, as if hearing the call. The honeybirds and the treetops respond enthusiastically to the Maasai honey hunters. The partnership has been concluded in a joyful exchange. The honey creeper is extremely good at spotting hives, step by step. It is leading its partner to the location of the delicacy. If the partner is too slow on its feet, it stops and waits. When it is almost close to its goal, it stops on a branch and changes its call. The translation probably means, this is the tree. Look carefully. The Maasai struck the tree trunk with a wooden stick. Soon there were wild beasts flying out of the tree holes. The honeybird was really good. It had accomplished its task. Next, it just has to wait patiently. Now, it was the turn of the human friends to step in. Their task is to take out the honey. Smoking will keep the angry bees as calm as possible. Compared to the temptation of sweet honey, a few stings are bearable for them. The honey hunters know better than anyone that a partnership is only sustainable if the benefits are shared equally. They must give their bird guides the most generous reward possible. Without it, they wouldn't even be able to find the hive. The honeybird was not polite. He flew straight to the table and ate. The little friends are also enjoying the delicious honey. It was a perfect partnership. Almost every Maasai boy knows that. If you don't give the honeybird his due, he will take you to the lion's den next time. Humans have learned how to find food in the grasslands, either purely on their own or by virtue of partnership. Wheat, barley, rice, corn are all actually herbs. When humans cultivate these weeds into crops, it means that their control over the grassland has taken a qualitative leap. These grains were able to feed thousands of people, directly promoting the development of farming civilization. Humans were finally able to build homes around the farmland and flourish. Those wild animals that jeopardized the farmland were treated as pests by humans. Tanzania is also located in the East African savanna, where there are continuous patches of high-quality rice paddies. The harvest season is about to begin, but the farmers are all worried. They know better than anyone that the annual plague of locusts and birds is coming. They had to be on their guard and keep a close eye on that horrible sound. The chattering noise soon spread. The numbers of the pioneers are already daunting, and a dense mass follows. Millions of Chuela finches flew in groups, covering half the sky like rolling black clouds. They are the most numerous wild birds on Earth, conservatively estimated at over 1.5 billion, and with their insatiable appetite for grain, they are constantly on the move. Wherever they go, it's as if locusts are moving in. If the owner of the farmland doesn't do something to stop these locust birds, they will wipe out their crops in an hour. In fact, farmers can't win this war of food defense at all. All they can do is minimize their losses. Coming to this place of food abundance, the koala bird builds a nest and lays its eggs and stays put. The trees here are forced to bear fruit, and the farmers have waited for the perfect opportunity to retaliate. They placed flammable materials in the woods. When evening came, the tired birds returned to their nests. A deflagration almost wiped out the flock, but by the time the grain is harvested, they'll be back as good as new and making a comeback. As mankind's control grew stronger, they incorporated almost all grassland habitats into their landscape. Farmland of all kinds is actually man-made grassland and the pristine natural grasslands are gradually shrinking. It seems easy for humans to dominate the plants of the grasslands, but it takes skill to dominate wild animals with free will for human use. When it comes to grasslands, we have to mention Mongolia. This is the most extensive grassland belt on Earth. It is home to the world's largest population of wild horses. Domestic horses are domesticated from wild horses. The Mongolian people's best skill is horse taming. Nomads are the natural masters of the steppe. Here they ride their horses to their heart's content. They are like fish flying in the shallows and eagles striking the sky. Their ancestor, Genghis Khan, 
led the Mongolian Iron Horse and created the most magnificent empire in history. It can be said that without war horses, there would be no Mongol Empire. Today, the human world has changed dramatically, but the Mongols' reliance on horses has not diminished. When they found wild horses on the steppe, they tried to capture and tame them. They drive the wild horses back to the Yur camp. This is just the beginning of the taming process. The men who harness the horses need to be physically strong and skillful. Because wild horses don't admit defeat easily, the herdsman first tries to lasso the foal so that the mare will come closer. A good horse realizes that its owner is pursuing a target. Success depends entirely on the cooperation between it and its owner. But even a young wild beast that has only recently been born will resist vigorously. It wants to break free. Once a group of foals has been successfully captured, it must be haltered while the iron is hot. Once the foal is haltered, it's time to attack the mare. It's a battle of strengths, with the mare's weight and strength unmatched by humans. Even if the mare is successfully reined in, the human being may be tucked to the ground. The three Mongolians also had trouble controlling the unruly wild horse. It was only after two hours, when the wild horses were exhausted, that the herders gradually gained the upper hand. The wild mare did not give in until they were reined in. The herders bring the foal over for milk, which is the only time the mare gives milk. The herders take the opportunity to harvest the horse's milk. They like dairy products that are different. Under the action of lactic acid bacteria, fresh horse milk ferments into a slightly alcoholic drink. Horse milk wine, one of the eight treasures of Mongolia, has a strong milky flavor mixed with a slight acidity and sweetness. It is a favorite traditional drink of the nomads and it must have dish for guests from afar. Herders have everything from the gift of the grassland. Although humans dominate the grassland, but how to protect and give back to it is the most important proposition now and in the future. In addition to the grassland, human beings often compare rivers to their mothers. How will humans living in the river basin survive the dangers of the rivers? Stay tuned for the next installment.